Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of the Divine Program of the World's History today on Saturday, May 18th, 2019, a Sabbath day, and I'm gathered here with Yerk Lisman in Belgium. Hello, Yerk. Hello, Brett. Nice to having me on again, and I'm very glad that we are going to continue our study in the book from Albert Close, The Divine Program of the World's History. I just uploaded the first part on my main channel a few days ago. I think it was Thursday afternoon. And I'm glad that I had started with that, and I hope that uh, many recordings still will come, because uh, today I had a little time extra, uh, an hour, an hour and a half before our reading, so I could prepare a little bit what we are going to read. And I can tell you this book is getting interest, more interesting with the minute, and every uh, every letter that we read, it gets more and more interesting. So I can hardly wait, or barely wait, to start. So when you're oh, ready please, to go, go right ahead, Jörg. Okay. No then. need for comment. <laughs> okay. We are on page 76 in the book, uh, on the second part of the book, as Brett always says. Uh, you have the first part and then the second part of the European history, which we are in right now. Page 76, and in the PDF it is page 82 of 168. So we are very close to being half uh, done with the book. But I can tell you it is very, very interesting, especially what we are going to read today. And since I've had time a little bit to prepare, you see there are some highlights. Um, 
this is because I had to read, I had the possibility to read and make some notes, take some notes there. So we are going to continue reading in the year 1558, uh, yeah, as we have mm -hmm. come here from uh, the uh, Protestant reformers, of course, uh, Latimer, Ridley, Rogers, and um, Hooper, John Hooper all in, in these pictures. Now we come to 1558 and this is an interesting time because this is the begin of the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. Protestant Church of England re-established after the reign of Bloody Mary that we spoke about earlier by Queen Elizabeth on ascending to the throne in 1558. One year later in 1559 we have the glorious return to England of the 800 exiled Protestant ministers of the gospel banished by Queen Mary. At first they united with the Church of England, but owing to the retention of the high church doctrines and rites, they separated in a few years. And here I have uh, I had to make a little comment. We have to take into consideration with what we are reading here that separation from the Anglican Church is a blessing, because it is close to what happened in 321 with Constantine, you know, when Constantine made Christianity the state religion of the Roman uh, of the Roman Empire in that time he did that and he did that not by taking the real biblical Christianity as the state religion but mixing with the holy with the profane giving it outwardly the name of Christianity of Christianity but inwardly keep teaching pagan rites traditions and um, doctrines yeah? And this is the same with the Anglican Church. So this is why I wrote this little comment and saying we have to take into consideration that separation from the Anglican Church is a blessing because it is close to what happened in 321 with Constantine when he mixed the pagan with the Holy Church. The Roman leaven was, and to this day, even in 2019, is in that church. Outwardly, it seems Protestant, but when you get to the core doctrines, you will see that the Romans still rule. They just gave the centuries old Catholic Church in England a new dress. The body hid thereunder is still Roman. Um, I think there are many people who don't still un un understand what I'm getting into because many people, as you say very often, have not a good understanding of this church history in England or mm. anywhere European history, and even many Europeans don't understand it. Mm -hmm. um, it all goes back to when Henry VIII, the King of England, wanted a divorce from his wife to marry another woman, uh, Anna Boleyn, I think uh, her name was. Yeah, that sounds right. And the Pope didn't want to grant him a divorce. So he found other ways to get rid of that woman. He beheaded a few of them and then get rid of them in, in different ways. But the point is, because the Pope didn't listen to the king's request, the king said, well, Pope, if you are not going to annul my marriage or give me a divorce of my marriage, then I'm going to make myself head of the church and I'm going to do it myself. Therefore, he put the Pope aside and put himself, the king of England, at that time Henry VIII, but every successive queen or king in the same position, as being the head of the church in England. But of course you have already had a church of England, and that church of England was as it was in all the other countries in Europe in the time, of course, was Roman Catholic, because there was no other official church. Now imagine when you, on one day, have a ruler that says from one day to the other, I now change this church into a Protestant church, but the whole hierarchy is still there. All the priests, all the deacons, all the bishops, all the people in the church hierarchy are still there, and all of a sudden they have to profess another belief. I think that is very hard to understand, or very hard to believe that they did so. So, the church was outward, outwardly, quote-unquote, baptized as Anglican, as Protestant now, because King Henry VIII broke all bonds with Rome, at least officially he did, and put himself up as the head of the church. But everything within the structure of the church still was Roman Catholic. You cannot change that overnight. And as we said often earlier already, it is easier to get a man out of Catholicism than to get Catholicism out of a man. 
So you had, of course, still Roman Catholic leaven within the structure of the new founded then quote unquote Anglican Church. And we will see that later also when, when you do the, when you take your time and do your own studies and you go to the 39 articles, which we will mention later, of the Anglican Church, the confession uh, of faith, as, as they say it, and you compare diligently the 39 points of that uh, confession with the Bible, you will see that there's a lot of Roman leaven still in there. These 39 articles is nothing that I would sign for. And even so wonderful men as Latimer and Ridley were part of writing these, I think, or, or, or were some, some other very famous uh, Protestant, um, uh, Protestants in England who uh, were part of the writing of these 39 articles. I'm not, I'm not sure that it was Latimer and Ridley, but anyway, you can look that up for yourself. And um, even though they were very committed to put a righteous paper together, a righteous uh, confession, a state of, uh, how, how do they say that, state of confession? Uh, no. Um, help me here, Brad. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, hmm. A creed of confession, or whatever you want to say. You know, like with mm -hmm. the Nicene mm -hmm. Creed, when they had that, yeah, mm -hmm. a confession of faith, yeah? When, yes, they wanted the to, when they wanted to put a, a, a correct confession of faith together, their confession still has had, or still has, even today, some uh, very much profound Roman leaven in there. So when you change the Church of England overnight from Roman Catholic to Protestant, you, of course, will understand that everything in the structure is not just switching colors from one day to another. Yeah? All the pillars painted black. You cannot pillar. Uh, you cannot paint all these pillars white overnight, and expect them to be white, meaning bear the truth and nothing but the truth, as the Bible, the true word of God, says. And everything else that they taught for centuries is being put out overnight. That is not possible. Therefore, you have to be very, con very uh, careful when we speak about the Anglican Church, and you have to take everything with a grain of salt. And this is exactly why I made this comment that I said, we have to take into consideration that the separation from the Anglican Church, which they did, that they came back here, um, these, uh, these ministers, the 800 exiled Protestant ministers, when they came back, because they were banished by Queen Mary, yeah, Bloody Mary, the Roman Catholic Queen of England, at first, they united with the Church of England, but owing to the retention of high church doctrines and rites, they separated in a few years. What does this mean? The author tells us in more eloquent words than I could express myself in English. He says, but owing to the retention of high church doctrines and rites. So they came back to this new quote-unquote English church, yeah, and they wanted to unite with the church, but they saw that in this church still are high church doctrines, and high church is a term that is used in Roman Catholicism. Yeah? So this means that when they came back and they wanted to unite with that church, they did at first, but the longer it took them, the more they saw that they are mixing the holy with the profane. And they were Puritans. Puritans don't mix the holy with the profane. So they went out of that church again. And this is so important to understand this. I mean, this is only this little paragraph here, but this is so important to understand. Yeah? Anyway, let's put the picture back up here. In 1559 then, the year later, Knox, yeah? we are speaking of uh, John Knox, Mightily oh, can I make a quick comment here oh, yeah. before we go on? Yeah, sure. I just quick was thinking, you know, uh, about, you know, I'm a carpenter. I do a lot of work in carpentry, and I had a uh, uh, job I was doing once where this lady's like, yeah, well, you know, this kitchen's taken a while, but Rome wasn't built in a day, she said. And I was like, oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, Rome was not built in a day. It took centuries. That's for certain. Yeah, and it's still, you know, how many people actually acknowledge we're still in the Roman Empire? I mean, it's very, very few, you know, because um, this demonic history and that 
that's exactly why we're reading this book is to get us focused on you know well what really is the Roman church what is the Roman doctrine all about well this high church party is exactly it it wasn't built in a day <laughs> no it wasn't that's built in for a day. sure many people don't Centuries. have many people don't even have an idea Brett that Rome already existed in the time of Babylon I'm speaking of the time of Babylon, of the Jewish captivity in Babylon, the time of uh, the writing of the book of Daniel. Mm. Mm -hmm. Rome was founded True. somewhere 750 before Christ. Yeah? But it didn't rise to power immediately. It wasn't built in a day. It took years and years to do this. And then first Babylon fell into the Medo-Persians, then the Medo-Persians fell into the Greek or the Grecians, and then Rome came to its power only 160 years before Jesus Christ. So it had almost 600 years to build up its strength. Yeah? Yeah, talk about predestination, eh? Yeah. Perfect and, example. And the only difference with Rome and all the foregoing kingdoms, like Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, is that they all were usurped by the predecessor, means Babylon was usurped by Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia was usurped by Greece, and Greece by Rome. But Rome will not be usurped by anything. Rome will be completely and utterly destroyed with the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what makes Rome a little bit special than all the others. That's why mm -hmm. this fourth animal, this fourth beast of Daniel, is different from all the others. It is a different beast, but it has had 600 years to climb into full power. It was about 160 AD, uh, 160 BC, before Christ, um, when Rome took over from the Grecians, yeah? which is about three, 340 years after the captivity of, in, in Babylon of the Jews ended. Yeah? And in the meantime, we have had two other kingdoms, Medo-Persia and Greece, all very short-lived when you compare them to Rome. Huh? Because Very when, you see, short. when yes. you see that Rome lives since 160 uh, BC, when it uh, when it came to its absolute power, but even started in the 700s before Christ, and we are now living in the 21st century after Christ, that makes the Roman Empire in a duration of about what 2,800 years. Very, very yeah, that's long. That's incredible. Very, that's very incredible. long. Yeah. Okay, but I, I just found that an, uh, an interesting little thing that we, we spoke about, this little article, and now we are coming to John Knox, who mightily helps forward the Reformation in Scotland. When John Knox returned from his five years' exile on the continent and landed in Leith on May 2nd, 1559, the news set Scotland on fire. Men choking with emotions grasped each other by their hand and shouted, John Knox has come! John Knox has come! It's almost like the Messiah has come, right? Ships mm. leaving the ports of Scotland hailed each other on the sea and shouted, John Knox has come! John Knox has come! Knox's thorough, uncompromising work. Uncompromising! Write that behind your ears! John Knox's thorough, uncompromising work saved Scotland from being cursed with a, domini uh, with a dominating high church party, as England afterwards was and is today. So here the author tells you in a little word, in a few words, what I just told you extensively in my first few minutes comment after reading the first little paragraph of this page. 1560. The Bible first divided into verses and published as the Geneva Bible. This Bible was translated at Geneva by the exiled Protestant ministers who then came back yeah, in England in 1558. This Bible was translated at Geneva by the exiled Protestant ministers and reformers during Queen Mary's bloody reign. It was published with the reformers' notes on the return of the exiles to England. And this is why many people hold on to the Geneva Bible, because it was written by Puritans, it was written by people in exile uh, under the persecution of Bloody Mary in England. But the problem that I have with the Geneva Bible is, as the author mentions here, 
that it was um, published with the reformers notes and many people just appreciate these this bible because of the notes the footnotes and i do not appreciate any bible that bears any footnotes that are not of god because i am of the opinion and maybe i'm alone i mean brett is with me i know that but mm -hmm. i don't know who else is with me and i don't care the point is the Bible is the pure word of God, and I don't want any man-made annotations to it. I don't want any man-made notes to it, because I want the Bible to give it the chance to explain itself to me. I want God to explain himself to me in his own words, and not with the words of men, because men have a wicked heart. And I don't say that all the comments are wicked, but I don't want to check everything double and thrice and four times. I want to believe the Bible. I want to embrace the Bible, you know. I want to hold it in my hand and I want to know that God speaks to me through his word. And I want him to explain his words to me. And everything that he doesn't explain, he has a reason why he doesn't explain it to me at this moment. Maybe he will explain it to me later on. Maybe he won't, but that is up to his will and not to mine. Yeah, please, Brad. Yeah, I was talking with my brother yesterday, and he started talking about uh, exegesis. And I yeah. was like, wait, what's that word? He says, it's a Bible commentary. Yeah. So, we had a little discussion yesterday on Bible commentaries, and I was telling him the same thing, Yerk, that it's always best to read the Bible and let it define itself to you. Mm-hmm. And it becomes like a crutch when you rely on other people's notes, you know? Yeah, that's right. Exegesis is uh, not, not per se commentary. It is more or less uh, the art to study the Bible, to explain the Bible, but uh, from a human standpoint, from, from man's standpoint, not from a right. godly standpoint. Exactly. It is man explaining the Bible to you. I mean, uh, Martin Luther had his exegesis also. And um, he uses, the word exegesis yes. is used in, in that regard with Martin Luther, for example, um, what he used when he translated the Old Testament. You know, Martin Luther first translated the, uh, the New Testament into German when he was on the Wartburg in 1520-21. Yeah? In a few weeks, he translated the complete New Testament. It took him more than 15 years later to translate the whole Old Testament and to revise the New Testament translations so that he came out with the very first complete Bible in 1536-1537. The point is that he first translated the New Testament from the original Textus Receptus as far as he uh, had it available at the moment into German, and then later on he translated the New Test uh, the Old Testament, but he did that with the understanding of the New Testament already. So he had a complete different understanding of very many verses of the Old Testament because he has read the New Testament first. Let's just take, for example, Isaiah 53 to make it uh, an, an interesting example to, to explain to our listeners here. When you read Isaiah 53 and you haven't read the New Testament, it is maybe a miracle to you. But when you read Isaiah 53, after you know that Jesus Christ is the fulfilling of the nine prophecies made in Isaiah 53 that are all dealing with him, and you have already read the New Testament and you have read the account of the kingdom of God that Jesus Christ came here on earth telling us of, then you understand Isaiah 53 with a complete different understanding. That is exegesis, that you can, from the understanding of the New Testament, put the Old Testament into new light of understanding, and also that you can put the New Testament in new light of understanding when you understand the Old Testament completely. That is exegesis. If it is kept to the Bible and the Bible alone, it is not exegesis when it creeps uh, when when there creeps into this the teaching of man and you have to rely on what man tells you instead of what God tells you. But when you study the Old Testament first and then read the New Testament, you will see the New Testament with different eyes. 
when you first read the New Testament and then you will read the Old Testament, then you will study the New, the Old Testament with completely different eyes. But that is because God opens your eyes and God leads, God leads you into all wisdom. As it says already in the Bible that by daily studies you will be led into all, uh, into all truth uh, with the Bible. But when you mix that with man's teaching... Well, that's what commonly is taught as exegesis, because it is that explanation of this guy or that guy. Calvin had an exegesis, Luther had an exegesis, uh, who else is there? Erasmus, for example, had an exegesis. Yeah? So that's, uh, that's a very interesting term to, to talk about. So yeah, that was probably an interesting conversation you had with your brother there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got into a good discussion on... Uh how the state uses church uh, doctrine and all that, you know, mm -hmm. all the arguments that come with that. And, of course, then he recommended I watch this movie about the area that I live in. <laughs> it was made, uh, oh, I don't know, 1971. This movie is called uh, The Emigrants, and that's with an E, not an I. And it's about the Swedish uh, migration here where I live from Europe. And um, yeah, it's really interesting, but we're not going to go into that topic. Let's stick to <laughs> what we're reading. Okay, so I'm going to continue in the book then. So, the Bible first divided into verses, so you see how late that happened. Not in the original Bible, not in the original scrolls, neither of the Law and the Prophets, nor of the New Testament, but only in the 16th century the Bible was divided into verses and published as the Geneva Bible. That Bible was translated at Geneva by the exiled Protestant ministers and reformers during Queen Mary's bloody reign. It was published with the reformers notes on the return of the exiles to England. And then we come to 1563. Now we have the publication of the 39 articles which I spoke about earlier. Yeah? And read those for yourself and you will see what I meant by the Roman Catholic leaven if you compare it against the Bible, the 39 Articles of the Church of England, of the Anglican Church. In 1567 then, let's just put the picture back on here. In 1567 then, the Jesuits arrive in Britain disguised as Church of England clergymen. Oh, sorry, I forgot about 1567. No, this is mm, <laughs> utter importance. <Yeah. laughs> the Duke of Alva commissioned by Philip II, uh, the King of Spain, to exterminate the Protestants in the Netherlands. In less than six years, the Duke of Alva puts to death 18,000 men and women by the sword, gibbet, rack, and by the flames. Ruin and dread of death drive thousands to England and from England further to the New World. Huh? I guess you know that, for example, the city of New York first was called New Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a city in Holland, in Netherlands, right? Mm, the right. people who fled the persecution by the Duke of Alva and went over to Great Britain and from there to the United States of America were the founders of the city of New Amsterdam, which we call today New York. That's real history where that comes from. They were driven out of their home because of the Roman Catholic persecution by the Duke of Alva. Now, also in 1567, the Jesuits arrive in Britain, disguised as Church of England clergymen and also disguised as Puritans. Thomas Heath, brother of the deposed Roman Catholic Archbishop of York, accidentally drops a letter in the pulpit from the Spanish Jesuits whilst preaching as a Protestant in Rochester Cathedral. Heath's lodgings searched by the government. A license from the Pope was found which authorized him to disguise himself as a Protestant minister of the Gospel and preach confusing doctrines. This is exactly according to the Jesuit oath, right? Right. Mix yourself under the Lutherans and mix where the, and, and teach where Lutherans are Calvinism. Go to Calvinists and teach where Calvinists are Lutherism, and so on. Mix the doctrines all together, and this is exactly what the author says here. Yeah? 
become a Protestant minister of the gospel or pretend to be one and preach confusing doctrines and by that help the Roman Catholic dogma of divide et conquera, mean divide and conquer. The terms of the Pope's bull indicated that there were many heaths in disguise all over the country. Many, many heaths were there. For this we can look at a wonderful book that I looked up today. It is called Rome's Tactics by Dean Good. Dean is the title. His name is William Good. He was a dean in the church. London, 1867. And um, Rome's Tactics, this is the complete title of the book. Rome's Tactics or A Lesson for England from the Past showing that the great object of popery since the Reformation has been to subvert and ruin Protestant churches and Protestant states by dissensions and troubles caused by disguised popish agents, with a brief notice of Rome's allies in the Church of England. Rome's tactics. So, of course, I prepared a picture because I looked that book up today. I'm going to show you the cover of the book. There's one that I took myself from the PDF itself. That's the one that I took with the whole title here. And you see this book is from 1868 when it was published. And here you have the official cover if you want to buy the book from Amazon. You can still get that today. William Good, as I said, he was Dean was his title. William was his name. William Good, Rome's Tactics for a Lesson. Sorry. <coughs> Oh, bless you. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, this just came over me. Oh, I had to sneeze there. Sure. <laughs> I'm still on. I'm sorry. You still live, or are you are you dead from the surprise? <laughs> 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 sorry, <laughs> sorry, brother. Not a problem. So what I just read here, this is taken from this book, Rome's uh, Rome's Tactics: A Lesson for England from the Past. Yeah, a lesson for England from the past. If they still wanna. Uh, listen to uh, they still want to have a a listening ear and uh, mm -hmm. see what Rome's tactics really are so this is what we just read here um, about the disguising of the Jesuits was taken from that book and it is not so big I think it is 117 pages or something uh, I can I can open this if you want. To. Oh, it's pretty small then. It's no, yeah, it's it's not a big one. It's here, 112 pages. It is. That's that's all that it is. Right. This is the book here. This is the preface. It has 112 pages, and it is an easy read. As you can see, it is uh, printed in good uh, Latin letters. Mm -hmm. So, this is the book, Rome's Tactics from 1868. Um, okay, but let's go back to this book. 1572. The massacre of French Protestants on St. Bartholomew's Day, August 24th, 1572. On the arrival of the Papal Nuncio's official report of the massacre, great rejoicings and public thanksgiving at Rome. The Te Deum sung and the medal struck by Antichrist Pope Gregory XIII. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with what a Te Deum is. I had never an idea what it really is, so I looked mm. it up. And it says, A Te Deum service is a short religious service based upon the singing of the hymn held to give thanks. And I can read to you the text that they sing in that uh, Te Deum. And they sang this, keep this in mind, to celebrate a massacre of more than 50,000 men, women and children in Paris in the day of August 24th, 1572. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This text is translated from the Book of Common Prayer, where it is in. It says, We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. 
the glorious company of the apostles, praise thee. The godly fellowship of the prophets, praise thee. The noble army of martyrs, praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The Father of an infinite majesty, thine honorable true and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, thou art the King of glory, O Christ, thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst not labor the virgins, abhor the virgin's womb. When thou hadst overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God and the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints, in glory everlasting. And now this is added later, mainly from the Psalms. So, you know, even the devil cites the Bible if it is to his advantage, right? Mm -hmm. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee and we worship thy name, ever world without ending. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy lighten upon us as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. And you can find anything on the explanation what Deum is. And when you click on the link in that article, you can find this on Wikipedia. This is where I got that from. Now, the point is that you see here how the Roman Catholic Church twists the word of God, twists the glory of our Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost to their needs by even speaking of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and making it their own to persecute, to exterminate and extirpate, if it were possible completely, the Huguenots, which were a Bible-believing Christian denomination in the south of France. And uh, you see here on the, on the bottom uh, a little medal that was struck at the time. Yeah? The Te Deum was sung that I just read to you, and a medal struck by Antichrist Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. Now let's have a look at the medal. And I made it very big so that you can easily see here. You have here the woman, which is like the woman in Revelation chapter 17, verse 6. Yeah? The whore of Babylon that is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs, holding a cross in the left hand and holding a sword in the right hand, persecuting all these people, killing all these people who are a demonstration of the Huguenots, of really God-fearing, Bible-following, Sabbath-keeping, Bible-believing Christians. That was the Saint Bartholomew massacre. And on the other hand, of, on the other side, of course, you have a picture of Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, who we will still read a little bit more on in this um, in this book, in the coming in the coming minutes and maybe even in the coming broadcast. Yeah, we will read a little bit more on him, or on this moron, however you want to say this. Um, mm. But this is the medal they struck. Directly after it happened, a gold medal struck in the commemoration of the persecuting, of the killing of at least 50,000 innocent men women and children in Paris in the time. I say 50,000 and you probably heard numbers of 70,000 and more, but you have to understand that this persecution, this murdering in France continued for several weeks. I'm just speaking of this one night and there it is supposed already in this one night on the 24th of August 1582, there it was already supposed to have been about 50,000 slaughtered souls in that time. <clears throat> so the Te Deum sung and the medal struck by Pope Gregory XIII to commemorate the slaughter with inscription Huguenotorum Stragis, which means slaughter of the Huguenots.
The medal represents the Church of Rome as a destroying angel offering the Huguenots the alternative of the crucifix or the sword, which Edmund Paris so blatantly put in the words in his book that he wrote in the 20th century, convert or die. In one hand the destroyer holds the crucifix, in the other the drawn sword. The dead lie all round at the feet of the blood-drunken slayer. Yeah, you see this here, but you saw that better even in the little medal that I gave to you, huh? that we just watched here. You can see all the killed people here on the side. I mean, when it is this big, it is probably easy to see. That was the idea why I put it here. Yeah. Okay, so this is from this medal. Um, Paper Rome offering French Protestants the alternative of convert or die, or crucifix or the sword. The St. Bartholomew medal struck by Antichrist Pope Gregory XIII in 1572 to commemorate the massacre of the French Huguenots. Note, the blood-drunken slayer holds the crucifix in one hand and the drawn sword in the other. The woman referred to here, uh, the woman that holds the sword and the... Uh, and the cross is of course the scarlet woman of revelations with the church uh, the church of rome saint john saw her in vision drunk with the blood of god's people and here comes a quote from the rv bible means the revised version and of course i deleted that and put the real text in of Revelation chapter 17 verse 6 from the King James where it reads and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus and when I saw her I wondered with great admiration this is the picture they put on this medal at least that was their intention to put on there yeah? that here they slew all the protestant Huguenots with the power of the sword of God, which is actually the sword of Satan, because we are talking about here the Queen of Heaven, in another way of how she was styled. From AD 312, the era of the indictions, yeah, we spoke already about that earlier, after the ten years of persecution between 303 and 313, and then you had the edict of uh, uh, the, 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 the early edict of, uh, I, I don't remember the name right now anymore, but that gave peace to the Christian persecution in the time. Ah, is that the Edict of Nantes? No, that's in 325. But it's, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's, it's no, no, no problem. No. Don't, don't be sorry. You're just trying to help. Um, it was just that there was made peace with the Christians in 313 after 10 years of persecution oh. between 303 and 313. And there is a name for that edict that Constantine gave already in the time to the Christians. Uh, I see. And then in 321, you know, came the change from, uh, came the official uh, quote-unquote conversion of the Roman Empire with making Christianity the state religion and changing the Sabbath day from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. And then in 325, you have the edict of, uh, uh, not the edict, but the Council of Nicaea. Mm. or nice in the south of France. We are going to talk about that later on. I, I just don't remember the edict names anymore, but that's okay. We spoke about that earlier in this book, so everybody can look that up or look it up on the internet for himself. Anyway, the author says here, from AD 312, the era of indictions, the papal indictions, and beginning of the imperial Roman church, supplanting paganism as the state religion of the Roman Empire, to this slaughter of the witnesses in 1572. So from 312 through 1572, there elapsed 1,200 three scores solar years. Falsified Roman Catholic history exposed. Also in 1572, in their frantic efforts to color and falsify history, and this is, was even new to me, it's very interesting what's coming up now. In their frantic efforts to color and falsify history, the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic quote-unquote truth societies have overstepped themselves in their attempt to whitewash Antichrist Pope Gregory XIII and his share in the Great Massacre of St. Bartholomew. The Jesuits publish 
plausible pamphlets by the thousands entitled St. Bartholomew's Day and the Huguenots, etc., in which they state that owing to the slow means of communication in those days, the Pope was at first misled by false intelligence, means information, that as soon as he learned the facts, he was horrified at the awful deed. He thought it was a political conspiracy, the Jesuits say. <laughs> Unfortunately for this piece of Jesuitry, the Pope had an official program drawn up and printed in Rome at the time. Original copies of this little four-page program exist today in our great European national libraries. One copy is in the library of Oxford University. That program states that it was the papal nuncio at Paris who sent the official account to the Pope. That program states that it was the destruction of the Huguenot sect the Pope rejoiced over. So, there is a paper out from the Pope himself to show his words lying. Yeah? The Jesuits say that he thought it was a political party which had been exterminated. The following, which we are going to read now, is an abridged translation from the copy in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, translated by the Reverend Dr. Bertolli, who is a former Jesuit priest. The Pope's official program on September 8th, 1572. So this is 14 days about after St. Saint Bartholomew's Massacre, right? That was on the mm -hmm. night on the 24th of August. Yeah? This is now the Pope's official program, September 8th. Oh, I understood wrong. Huh? Let's see, what does it say? Translated from the copy in Oxford University Library. Order of the most solemn procession made by the Pope in the August city of Rome when the most happy news came of the destruction of the Huguenot sect. Yeah? This is what the Pope really thought about it, not what the official later teaching is when the Jesuits tried to falsify it, as we just read here, yeah? in their frantic offers to color and falsify history, the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic True Societies have overstepped themselves in their attempt to whitewash Pope Gregory XIII and his share in the Great Massacre. That's what they did later on. They wanted to whitewash the Pope. They wanted to say, oh, he didn't know, and it was all the misunderstanding. But here we have a paper that he published 14 days afterwards. So, he couldn't have been betrayed, could he? This is one of the rare moments where we get a paper out of the Roman Catholic Church where it states the truth of what the Pope really thinks of the things that took place. Quote, as soon as the Pope received the news of the death of Admiral Colony and other chiefs of the Huguenot sect, before ordering a general procession, he requested the cardinals then present at Rome to assemble in a solemn consistory where letters from the papal nuncio at the court of France referring to the destruction of the Huguenot sect were read. Immediately afterwards, His Holiness, with all the cardinals and most beautiful order, went to the church of St. Mark, where the best singer sang a most beautiful Te Deum Laudamus. I just read to you the Te Deum, right? Mm -hmm. This done, the Pope solemnly consigned the cross to the most illustrious Cardinal Orsini for the French legation, and ordered that on Monday next, the feast of the nativity of the most glorious Virgin Mary, at twelve o'clock all religious confraternities, companies and the clergy should meet together in St. Mark's in order to begin therefrom a most solemn procession. On the appointed day the procession was opened by the confraternities and companies. Then followed the religious orders. Then followed the parish priests. Then the canons, each one taking that place to which the importance of his church in the good city of Rome gave him right. Afterwards followed the members of his holiness's court, all wearing long robes suitable for such a solemnity. Immediately after came the golden cross of the Pope, 
followed by the most reverent prothonotaries, auditors of the rota, bishops and most illustrious cardinals, all clothed in pontifical robes and surrounded by the Swiss guards. Now, Brett, do you understand the word prothonotaries? No. No, I didn't either. So I'm glad that you don't understand it either because I looked it up and I'm going to tell you what this is. The word prothonotaries speaks of, the word prothonotar is since 1447 in English mm. as chief scribe of a court by L.L. Fronotarius from Greek Frotonotarios, uh, Froton first scribe, originally the chief of the College of Records of the Court of the Byzantine Empire from the Greek uh, and that word I can't read, of course, because I can't read Greek letters. Protos, meaning first, and Latin, notarius. So they put Greek and Latin together. Proto, notarius. Protos, first. Notarius, Latin. Uh, so Greek and Latin together. The H appeared in medieval Latin. The title was awarded to a number of senior notaries. In short, that means modern scribes. You remember Jesus Christ ranting against the scribes and the Pharisees. Yeah? Matthew chapter 23 and 20, uh, Matthew chapter 23. Mm -hmm. So here in this procession, immediately after came the golden cross of the Pope, followed by the most reverend prothonotaries, meaning the scribes of the Roman Catholic Church, auditors of the Rota, Bishops of the most illustrious cardinals, all clothed in pontifical robes and surrounded by Swiss guards. The ambassadors of the foreign powers of the papal court came next, and last of all the Pope under a canopy of silken velvet and embroidered with golden figures, which was carried by several of the principal gentlemen. Such a crowd of common people filled the street to see and accompany the said procession that the Swiss guards of the Pope could scarcely keep back such, con such a concourse. Finally, the procession was closed by a magnificent and gallant body of light-armed cavalry. But the most gorgeous and wonderful spectacle of silk, of gold and other most beautiful things requisite for such a function was to be seen in St. Louis Church of the French nation to which the procession betook itself. All under the charge of Cardinal Ferrara, the titular of the church. The most illustrious Cardinal of Lorraine, together with the French ambassador, received the Pope at the door of the church with a most joyful look on his face, uh, you know, because of the slaughter they did a fortnight before, and gave him the cross to kiss with other due ceremonies. After which the Pope, the Cardinals and the most reverend bishops, having taken their appointed places, the most illustrious French Cardinal Legensis sang High Mass as a thanksgiving for the great favor the French nation had received from our Lord God. The Mass was responded to by the musicians of our Lord the Pope, who sang so sweetly and beautifully that the hearts of all who were present at the city of Rome at, uh, and the city of Rome were filled with great joy, thereby making known how greatly this city was attached to religion and to the kingdom of France. Outside of the church and over its doors there was the, a most elegant inscription, in golden letters emblazoned on a violet silk cloth with the colors and figures of the arms of France which for the pleasure of readers is here transcribed, quote, To God the best and greatest. To the most blessed father Gregory the Thirteenth, supreme pontiff. To the sacred college of most illustrious cardinals. To the senate and people of Rome. Charles the Ninth. The most Christian king of the French, filled with zeal for the Lord God of hosts, almost all the heretics and rebels of his kingdom having been suddenly removed as by a smiting angel divinely sent, never to be forgetful of so great a benefit, himself now greatly abounding in most solid joys, sends congratulations for the truly stupendous effects, the perfectly incredible results the completion in all respects, 
abounding with divine favor of the counsels given for that end, the assistance sent, the prayers, supplications, vows, tears and sighs of himself and all Christians for the past twenty years to the Most High God. This great happiness which has happened at the beginning of the pontificate of the Most Blessed Father Gregory XIII not long after his admirable and divine election, together with the continuation of the most unflagging and prompt Eastern expedition, foreshadows the restoration of ecclesiastical affairs and the vigor of flourish and flourishing state of religion which was languishing. For this great favor the King of France, absent in body, but present in spirit, here in the church of his ancestor St. Louis, thanks Almighty God and suppliantly beseeches his mercy that such a hope may not fail. Charles of Lorraine, Presbyter Cardinal of the Holy Roman Church under the title of St. Apollinaris, here wishes that this should be made known to all. Anno Domini means in the year of our Lord, 1572, 8th of September. Then follows the Pope's prayer, thanking God for this great victory, victory over the martyrs and the saints of our Lord Jesus Christ. Never ever forget that while reading this. Quote, Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, who resisted the proud and givest grace to the humble, we give thee devout thanks and sing unto thee songs of praise. Because regarding the faith of thy servants thou hast granted to the Catholic people a glorious and joyful victory over treacherous nations. We beseech thee mercifully to continue what thou hast faithfully begun to the praise and glory of thy name, which we, thy servants, suppliantly invoke through Christ our Lord etc. Finis means end. This is the end of this translation of this paper. Yeah, hmm. Whew. yeah that yeah. Uh, was quite a bit, right, Brett? What yeah, we just read there? Pretty Any comments? Warped. Pretty, pretty, pretty incredibly warped what uh, people will perceive as being quote, holy and quote, divine unquote. I mean, you know, this Tadeum, uh yeah, I, I I don't know. It just um brings back memories of childhood in the Lutheran church, I'll tell you that. Mm. Uh you know, uh the ritual of it all, you just get lost in the ritual and you don't see the great evil going down here, you know? Right. This is what happens in the in the Roman Church and in all the Protestant churches that are following Roman Romish doctrines. Is uh, you just can't see the devil in the details because it's too damn subtle. But uh, wow, quite revealing, isn't it? That the um, the uh, Pope has this prayer here at the end. Yeah, I, I I think what is most profound about what we just read is that we see that how the Roman Catholic Church succeeds in using the words of God against him, turning it all 180 degrees around. Mm -hmm. Outwardly, they let it sound like they did really something good. And only if you know the Bible, you know how satanic, how devilish they actually were. Being glad on having had this success, this quote-unquote victory, as the paper just stated, but victory over the saints of the true Lord Jesus Christ, not the Lord Jesus Christ of the Roman Catholic Church, which is the Babylonian god Tammuz, but over the Jesus Christ of the Bible, the only begotten Son of the Father in heaven. Yeah? And with everything that we just read, we see how the Roman Catholic Church is able or at least trying to twist the truth 180 degrees. And this is something that you can see all through her history and even up to the latest history in the end of the 20th century, when they are going to make the victims the perpetrators. And I cannot think of any better examples like, for example, Waco and Tony Alamo Ministries. 
Yeah. Tony Alamo Ministries is uh, quite uh, uh, an object to study. And, you know, if you're not familiar with them, it might be very difficult for you to, you know, if you're familiar with Protestantism, certainly it isn't difficult. But if you're not, uh, you're going to run into some pretty disturbing uh, false information about Tony Alamo that's just everywhere. You know, that he was some type of pedophile or something, because this is exactly what they did with Tony Alamo. They pinned the pedophilia to him instead of, you know, the church or the the hierarchy, which is involved in a lot of pedophilia around the world, as we see right now. Yeah, they make the victims the perpetrators and the perpetrators mm -hmm. the victims. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. the policy of the Roman Catholic Church. And I couldn't think of any better example than reading to you this paper that is reserved in four copies all over the world and here translated even by a former Jesuit or by a Jesuit into plain English that tells us what the real understanding of the Pope was in 1572 on the 8th of September, 14 days after the St. Bartholomew Massacre. Huh? He told us very clear what happened. And what happened was that the Pope gave one explanation to the outside world. Oh, I have had wrong information. I thought we were dealing with a political conspiracy. I thought we were doing just correctly when we killed all those people but this paper puts out in the open for everybody with eyes to see that the popery that the papacy that the Roman Catholic Church that the Vatican is speaking with a cloven tongue and is selling you one thing on the inside and another thing on the outside And when they so-called make a statement, like the Pope first did, when singing the Te Deum, when getting that coin minted, and celebrating the slaughter of the Huguenots, then later bringing out the paper and saying, oh, this was all a mistake, a wonderful mistake that, and that one night only cost at least 50,000 men, women and children their lives, right? Mm -hmm. And even if it was a political conspiracy, even if that what the Pope first thought it was would have been true, still then Jesus Christ said, don't do harm to any man, thou shalt not kill. And the Roman Catholic Church killed millions, uncountable millions over the face of time in her rule since actually shortly after the apostolic church's time until today the May 2019 and I think Brett that we are bringing the reading here to a close for today and I'm going to leave to you the closing remarks and we're going to continue with this part of the book next time in our next reading and I'm looking forward to that which will probably be tomorrow for today, I thank you very much for watching and listening, especially you, Brett, who are here with me. And then to get to, tomorrow we will have a broadcast with Brother Michael and you and continue the reading of this wonderful, most wonderful book from Albert Close, The Divine Program of the World's History. And in the meantime, I want to tell you, read your Bible. But I'm leaving it to Brett to close down the broadcast for today. Thank you, Yerk, for the reading today. And yes, this is a really disturbing pattern that we're seeing in history, and we're seeing that it has been repeated. And we've lived through uh, the uh, the uh, aftermath of September 11th. Now, uh, 2001. It'll be 18 years this year, and. Uh, you can see that uh, there's uh, a lot to do with the Roman Catholic hierarchy here and how they just use these different 
tactics over and over and over again in history. And there's nothing new under the sun here. It's just that we're rediscovering what has been lost for a long period of time and uh, trying to apply it to our present life today and trying to make sense out of this confusing and indoctrinated world that we live in. And um, sadly, uh, I think it uh, just gets more and more uh, small as we continue in our study. It just uh, it doesn't seem to uh, erupt into a, uh, <laughs> a large amount of people that are viewing these videos, but it's not the numbers that count. It is the uncompromising position that we hold and we will continue as long as God grants us grace to do so. And I would just want to thank Yerk again and looking forward to seeing everyone next time. And God bless. Bye-bye for now. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire.